Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have two hours of stories as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's see if we can reach two likes on this video. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as I'm trying to reach 10 subscribers. Sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. Life can take us in strange directions, no matter how intricately our best plans are laid out. Life has a way of disregarding them, as if they were nothing more than a fly buzzing around its head. For example, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I'd had a few colleges in mind and was looking forward to graduating high school. Now I'm in Ketchikan, Alaska, getting ready to head north. I'm going to be leaving a lot of my technology here, as it'll be useless once I get where I'm going. Which, come to think of it, is nowhere really. I don't have a plan, but regardless, I wanted to take a moment to recount the events of the last couple years that led me here. For starters, my name's Jake, and I've been living on the road for quite a while now. I'm from a small town in the Midwest called Riverstone, where I was born and raised. Some people from small towns tend to dislike them, or at least can't wait to leave. Not me, though. I loved Riverstone, and it breaks my heart to know I'll never be able to go back. All because of the events which took place my senior year. It was a cool Friday night at the end of homecoming week. My classmates and I sat on our school's bleachers, cheering on our football team with enough energy to power the whole town. We were seniors, so this was going to be our last homecoming game. We wanted to enjoy it while it lasted. At the end of the first quarter, there was a short timeout to let people get snacks and use the restroom or whatever while the teams got ready to play again. My friends and I were sitting at the back of the bleachers, so we had a pretty clear view of the field and surrounding area. Two of them had gone to get snacks, while the other, a guy named Matt, was messaging his girlfriend on his phone. I, meanwhile, just stared out at the crowd and field, not really thinking about anything. As I scanned the crowd, my eyes fell upon a girl across from me in the away team's bleachers. It was hard to make out any details of her face, but from what I could see, she was gorgeous. Long brown hair, glasses, and a smile so bright it rivaled the overhead lights. I continued to steal glances at her occasionally. For looks aside, I was really just trying to see if she was there with a boyfriend, or if she was playing for their team. She wasn't wearing a jersey, which gave me hope, but that fact was made immediately irrelevant just before halftime. After a particularly good play by her team, I looked up to gauge her reaction only to be met by bare flesh where her face used to be. And she was looking in my direction. At least, the chill down my spine told me she was looking at me. It was hard to tell without any facial features. On top of that, she was dead still, like a scarecrow in a field of swaying corn. The people around her jostled and swayed, but she didn't move an inch. Not a single person took notice of her either. People bumped into her a few times, but they didn't react, as if the way she acted was perfectly normal. Thoroughly freaked out, I nudged Matt and got his attention. Thankfully, I'd pointed her out to him earlier in the game, so he knew where to look. In the moments I looked away and back again, though, she had returned to normal. Matt gave me a quizzical look for pointing the girl out to him again, but... I was too dumbfounded to care. I thought maybe it was the distance, that my eyes had simply lost focus for a second, and turning my head got them to refocus, an explanation which, at the time, made total sense. So I brushed it off and continued watching the game. Now, I need to give a bit of context for this next part. From where my friends and I were sitting, we could see the opposing team's sideline clearly. This was perfect, since their coach was an absolute hothead. I mean, like, 
forehead vein bulging, red in the face kind of guy. Every time his team would mess up, he'd be shouting like his life depended on it. And it was hilarious. So when his players made a mistake, I would scan their sideline to see his reaction. After one such play, I did like I always had, but found the bare flesh looking up at me once again. Just like with the girl, the coach stood completely still despite all the people moving around him, and no one seemed to notice his odd behavior or lack of a face. Afraid that looking away might cause it to disappear again, I tried to get Matt's attention without breaking line of sight. Unfortunately, the universe had other plans as a man shuffled past me just as I was tapping Matt's arm. By the time the man passed, the coach was back to his shouting, red-faced self. Matt looked over at me. The look on my face must have caused him to speak up. Hey man, you alright? He asked, placing a hand on my shoulder. I continued to stare at the coach, but was pulled out of my dismay by Matt's hand. Yeah, I said, not facing him. Just thought I saw someone I knew. You sure? You look like you've seen a ghost. I turned to look at him. Yeah, man, I'm good. My words were cut off as a lump lodged itself in my throat. Behind Matt were my two other friends, but next to them were people we didn't know. The closest of those people... The one right next to my friend was leaning forward in his seat. His arms hung straight down, limply swaying within the crowd. His head was turned at an angle just too sharp to be natural, and his face was gone. I lost it. I stood up and barreled through the audience with instinct and adrenaline guiding my every move. Before I knew it, I was out of the crowd and racing towards the parking lot. My phone began to ring, but I didn't answer it. All I could do at that moment was run, so I did. My feet hit the pavement and my lungs heaved air as I ran to my car, jumped into it, and peeled out of that parking lot faster than ever. Honestly, looking back, I'm surprised I didn't get stopped by someone or pulled over. Yes, I should count myself lucky, because in that state, I probably would have been arrested. But that didn't happen, and I made it home in one piece. I told my mom I wasn't feeling good and locked myself in the room for the rest of the night. I tried to rest, but my mind wouldn't stop thinking about the faceless people. No matter what I did to distract myself, the thoughts just kept coming. I did manage to fall into a restless sleep eventually, though. But when I woke up the next morning, it was into an entirely new world. Over the course of the next school year, I continually saw the faceless entity. There was no consistency to it, at least not that I could notice, but it only popped up in crowds and only affected humans. Activity slowed dramatically as the weather grew colder, but picked right back up again in the spring. That was when I got the idea to try and get proof that what I was seeing wasn't just in my head. It started as a spur-of-the-moment thing. I was out with some friends, including Matt, when I noticed it standing across the street. It had possessed a businessman and was staring at me. Notably, it still held a cell phone to its ear with one hand and a briefcase in the other. My skin began to crawl with the chill of its gaze, but my phone vibrated in my hand, causing the light bulb to shine. Without a second thought, I held my phone in my peripheral vision, careful not to pull my focus away from the creature and open the camera app. I held the device as steady as I could and snapped multiple pictures. When I was done, I felt comfortable enough to look away so I could examine the photos, only to find they were useless. The pictures were so blurry, it was impossible to make out any significant details. The shape of the man was obvious, as was his surroundings, but everything else was incomprehensible. I considered at first that maybe I'd been shaking while I took the photos, but when later attempts looked the same, I knew it wasn't me. Disappointed, I deleted the photos like an idiot inside. I looked back to where the creature had been, 
and found the businessman walking by as if nothing had broken his stride while he talked on the phone. I looked over to my friends and found Matt giving me a quizzical look. Thought I saw a cool bird, I said. Since when do you bird watch? He asked, grinning. I don't. It was just a cool looking bird. Well, let me see. The picture didn't turn out. The camera was out of focus. Matt gave me another look, this one a mixture of knowing curiosity. The subject was quickly dropped though, and we got back to just hanging out. Ever since, I've tried multiple times to get pictures of the thing with multiple different cameras, both digital and analog, only to get the same result, a blurry image with no discernible details, which I guess could be evidence in and of itself or it's just proof that I'm a crappy photographer. From there, things continued to escalate as summer rolled in, and it got to the point where I was seeing the thing every single day. Even on my days off, when I never left the house, I'd see it standing in the street outside my house, just staring at me through the windows. I tried researching it, believe me, but every time I looked up something about faceless people, I'd either get Slender Man or some obscure creepypastas. I considered talking to my friends, but I thought they'd think I was crazy. Hell, at the time, I thought I was losing it. So I did the only thing I could, and confided in my parents. One thing you should know about my parents is that they loved me and my little sister with all their hearts, but they were not what you'd call cool parents. They could be very strict at times and were very demanding more often than not. They expected a lot from me and my sister, but it's only because they wanted us to succeed in life and never sell ourselves short. That being said, I heard them mention throughout my childhood how they didn't believe in mental illness. They thought that depression, anxiety, hell, even schizophrenia is something that could be just thought away. That should make it clear enough that such things don't run in my family at all, at least as far as I know. So I was scared going into the dinner. I'd had everything I wanted to say laid out in my head, and I even had a few of the better pictures I'd taken to help plead my case. My sister was staying at a friend's house, so she wouldn't be there for any fallout. It was foolproof in my mind. Mom, Dad... There's something I need to talk to you about, I said once we finished eating. We were sitting at the table, my dad was at the head to my right, and my mom was sitting across from me. What's up, sweetie? My mom asked, wiping her mouth with a napkin. Dad didn't say anything. He just tilted his head to face me. Well, I'm not sure how to explain it, I began. So I'm just going to cut right to the chase. I pulled out the photos from my back pocket and handed them to my mom. She took them and her expression grew confused. I've been seeing faceless people, I said feeling ridiculous. As soon as I spoke, my mom's eyes grew wide and the color drained from her face. She threw the pictures on the floor and stood up from the table in unison with my dad. You what? My dad shouted making his way around the table towards me. I stood and held my hands up defensively. What? Dad, what's the big... I tried to say, but was interrupted when he grabbed my shirt collar with both hands. How long has this been happening? He yelled. My mother retreated into the kitchen, her sobs practically shaking the walls. I don't know, I stammered. Since... since September, I guess. September? Why didn't you tell us sooner? He continued to yell. I... I don't know. I didn't think you'd believe me. I could hardly believe it myself. I raised my voice with that last sentence, trying to gain a semblance of control. Does your sister know? He said, pushing me away from the table towards the living room. No, I haven't told anyone but you. I said while trying to keep my balance. Good. Then get the hell out of this house and don't ever come back. He shouted, moving his steel grip to my shoulders and pushing me with even more force. Mom, 
I yelled, trying to fight back against my dad's force. Why? She wailed in the kitchen. Why did it have to be my baby? I struggled with my dad for a while, begging him not to do this. But his face was resolute, despite the tears welling in the corners of his eyes. In the end, though, he won out with a knee to my stomach that winded me enough to let him shove me to the floor. He dragged me by my arms across the living room and towards the front door. He opened it, picked me up to my feet, and gave one last shove, sending me sprawling out onto the front step. Just before he closed the door, I could see the sadness overtaking his anger, and heard my mother's continuous wails. For the next couple hours, I banged on the door repeatedly begging to be let back in. I got no response. Eventually, the realization they weren't going to let me back inside took hold, so I switched to begging for my car keys, so I could at least sleep in there if I had to. I heard some shuffling inside, and after a few moments, my keys and wallet came flying out of the bedroom window. I picked them up from the front lawn and walked to my car. I sat there for a long time, just swimming in my thoughts and emotions until the streetlights came on. The sudden, off-white glow pulled my attention for just long enough to get my head on straight. For the moment, my emotional turmoil was buried beneath ideas of what to do or where to go next. My first thought was to call my extended family. Aunts, uncles, cousins, even my grandparents lived within driving distance. I figured I could stay with one of them and let this situation blow over, but all of my calls were rejected. Assuming my parents had contacted them, I started calling my friends. Most of them answered, but when I explained the situation, they instantly hung up. So as much as it killed me, I decided to call Matt, but not tell him the specifics of what happened. I wanted to see him in person before I told him any of that. Yo, he said after a few rings. Hey man, you busy? Nah, I'm just chilling, what's up? Uh, my parents are throwing a fit right now, and I just need to talk to somebody about it. Sure, man. You want me to come by your place? Actually, let's meet at Brewery Park. But let me get into some nicer clothes and I'll be there in ten. Alright, man. See you soon. With that, I drove to the park in silence. With how hectic my head was at the moment, the radio would have been just noise anyway. I got there well before Matt would, so I got out of my car and headed over to the playground. I climbed to the top of the dome-shaped jungle gym and sat in my usual spot on the cool metal. I watched the sky turn from light blue to pink and orange on the horizon as the time pit ticked by. My paranoia grew every minute I was out there, but from my position, I could see everything around me. If anyone or anything appeared, I'd see them long before they got close. I checked my phone over and over again, but had no word from Matt. When he finally did arrive, I'd been there for over 20 minutes. He pulled up, parked next to my car, and jogged over shortly after. Man, it's been a minute since we were here last, he said when he was close enough. What happened to be there in 10? I asked, masking my anger poorly. Sorry, I got a bit distracted, but I'm here now. That's got to count for something, right? I guess. So what's up? He said as he climbed to sit beside me. I sighed and looked down at my interlocked hands in my lap. Despite an extra ten minutes of prep time, I hadn't even thought about how to bring this up to him. Gummy worm? Matt asked. I turned to face him and saw he held a freshly opened bag of gummy worms in one hand, and was offering me a few with the other. Sure, thanks, I said, taking the treats. We sat in silence for a bit, eating our candy and watching the sky continue to change. I knew time was short, though. I wanted to get out of town while there was still daylight, if possible. So, I finally spoke up. Listen, Matt. This is really hard for me to talk about. I began. It's okay, bro, he said. 
You know I got your back no matter what. I turned my head to look at him, and he beamed at me. Then his eyes grew wide. Aw oh, man, don't tell me you're coming out to me right now. He said. What? I replied. Matt laughed. I'm just saying. You told me your parents were having a fit, and you didn't want to be home right now, so I just figured, you know. No, dude, that's not it at all. Oh, that's good. Not that I wouldn't accept you if you were gay. It'd just be weird for me. I just stared at him incredulously. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Tell me what's up. He said, popping another gummy worm into his mouth. I took a moment to gather myself again, and then spoke. Do you remember homecoming? When I freaked out and ran from the bleachers to go home? I asked. Yeah, I remember. Matt said while chewing. You said you were real sick and had to go home. Yeah, that night, well, I wasn't really sick. I was freaked out because... Because I kept seeing a faceless person in the crowd. Matt furrowed his brow and turned to look at me. What do you mean? He asked. I then explained everything from that night onward. I explained the reason I took pictures of the businessman when we were out, and my parents' reaction when I told them about it. As I talked, Matt's expression turned more and more serious. By the time I was done, he wasn't facing me anymore. His head and eyes cast downward to the wood chips below us. An uncomfortable silence passed before either of us moved. I can't be around you, Matt said jumping off the jungle gym. He hit the ground hard and straightened up, still not looking at me. I'm sorry, Jake, he continued. My parents warned me something like this might happen, and told me to get as far away as possible from whoever told me about it. He began to walk away, and I leapt to the ground to follow him. Wait, Matt, please. I said, desperation creeping into my voice. I don't know who else to turn to or where to go. I'm scared, man. Please. He continued walking without saying a thing. So you're gonna forget about me? Just like that? I spat venom, replacing the desperation. Everything we did as kids, all the stuff we got into in high school, all the times I was there for you, you're just gonna forget that? This is different, he said as he unlocked his car. How? I shouted. How is this different? Dude, I don't know what's going on or why everyone is ignoring me. Can you at least tell me that? I feel like the only person on earth who doesn't know what's happening. Matt got into his car and started the engine. My heart sank at the thought of him just driving away, but instead he rolled down his window just enough to talk to me. It doesn't have a name, he said still not looking at me, but my grandma called it Gazitib. What is that? I asked. It's German. I don't know what it means. Look it up when you get a chance. Okay, but... Before I could say another word, Matt put his car in reverse. I slammed my hand down on the roof of it to stop him. Matt, wait! I yelled. He didn't move, but also didn't put his car back in park. Let me stay at your place tonight, please, I said. One night, that's all I'm asking. I just don't want to be alone if this thing is coming after me. Indecision played across Matt's face. I felt bad for doing this to my friend, but I just needed the one night. One night to get my feet under me and come up with a real plan. Okay, he said after a long pause. One night. Follow me home. You know where it is. With that, he backed up quickly and sped out of the parking lot. I hopped in my own car and sped all the way to Matt's place. We got there in record time, and Matt walked with me inside, though he still gave me the cold shoulder. His parents greeted me as warmly as ever, and it almost brought me to tears thinking that I'd more than likely never get this response from my own parents ever again. When they asked why I was coming over so late, Matt chimed in with his coming out of the closet story, and I didn't argue. 
The rest of the night was spent in Matt's room, going through bouts of silence broken up by the occasional game of Halo or Mario Kart. Most of the time we just sat on our phones or watched Netflix. We both agreed to go to sleep around midnight, but before we really got settled in, Matt started digging through his closet. After a few seconds, he pulled out a backpack and his old Nintendo Switch. He put the handheld into the bag and began filling it with snacks from the hidden stash he kept under his bed. When he was satisfied, he moved over to his stack of games and looked at them for a moment before turning to me. Which ones do you want? He asked. What? I replied. Which ones do you want? He repeated. You can't have Smash Bros, though. That one's mine. I knew right away what he was doing. Matt, I can't take... I began. Look, if you're going to be out on the road, then you'll need something to entertain yourself. He said, looking back at the games. So which ones do you want? If you don't pick, I'm going to pick for you. In spite of my misgivings, I took Mario Kart 8 and Breath of the Wild. I'll throw in Puyo Puyo Tetris for free, Matt said, dropping the game case into the bag. He zipped it up and handed it over to me. I hesitated for a moment but took the bag from him still. Thanks, I said placing the bag next to my spot on the floor. Don't mention it, Matt said. He turned off the lights and got into his bed while I got comfortable on the floor. I knew sleep wasn't going to come easy for me but I managed to drift off after a little while. I was awoken in the middle of the night by loud clanging downstairs. It sounded like someone was sifting through pots and pans in the kitchen. I sat up and checked my phone. The time read 4.36 a.m. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I looked over to Matt's bed and found it vacant. His blankets were strewn aside and the door to his room was open. My heart began racing in my chest as I got up and crept over to the open door. I peeked around the corner and saw Matt crouched at the top of the stairs. Light came from downstairs on the left side, which led into the kitchen. Psst, I hissed as quietly as I could. Matt's head whipped around so fast, I thought it had twist off his neck. Relief washed over him as he realized it was me and he gestured for me to come to him. I inched my way out into the hall and crouched over to him. I think someone broke in, Matt whispered when I was close enough. It was then that I noticed he held his pocket knife in one hand. What should we do? I asked. Before Matt could reply, the clanging downstairs ceased. We both tensed and stared at the bright doorway just below us. We didn't hear any footsteps, but the lights in the kitchen suddenly went off. Something that shouldn't have been possible, since the light switch was a good eight feet away from the stove and cabinets. Now bathed in darkness, we crouched there in silence. My eyes had adjusted to the bright light, meaning I was basically blind until they readjusted to the darkness again. They never got the chance, though. Even in the shadows, I could see it poke its faceless head around the corner from the kitchen. It moved with mechanical smoothness, stopping just where the nose would be and only exposing the top half of its head. Its hand reached out and gripped the corner of the wall as if to steady itself. No, not to steady itself. It was getting ready to pounce. Matt, we need to move, I whispered tugging on his shirt. That's my mom, he said. In the heat of the moment, I'd forgotten that the creature didn't have a form of its own. It always had to borrow one. Matt, she's going to be fine, I promise, I pleaded. Right now, we need to get away from it. Normally, it would vanish as soon as I looked away, but something was different now. I'd seen it move. It was in a position to attack. I didn't know what would happen now, but that same instinct to run screamed inside me like it had during homecoming. Okay, okay, let, let's go, Matt said. We both began to move backward, but the creature mirrored it by moving closer to us. 
We stopped, and it stopped. My heart pounded impossibly in my chest as I realized we were at a stalemate as soon as we made a break for it. So would the creature, and I'd put money on it being faster than the two of us. Run. Matt hissed through gritted teeth. What? I asked. Go get the bag and climb out my bedroom window. I then remembered that Matt's house had an old metal trellis just outside his bedroom window. We used it tons of times to sneak in and out of his house when we were younger. But that was years ago. It's not going to hold me, I said. It will, he said. I used it just last week to go see Kylie. I knew there was no arguing with him, and a small part of me hoped that if I ran, perhaps the creature would chase me and forget about Matt entirely. Thanks, was all I could say to him before I slowly crept backward. As expected, the creature mirrored my movement. I stopped, took a breath, and went for it. I turned as quickly as I could and bolted from Matt's bedroom. I heard the thing rush up the steps behind me, followed by Matt's scream. In one fluid motion, I grabbed the bag he'd prepared for me and ran for the window. Thankfully, we'd kept it open last night, so I was able to burst through the screen and hang on the window sill. I got my feet planted on the trellis, just as the sound of footsteps raced towards me from inside. I reached down with one hand and grabbed the metal just as a steel grip took my other one. An ungodly crunch sounded through the air as the creature gripped my fingers so tightly it felt like they were broken. As if I weighed nothing, it began to pull me back into the window, but I screamed and pulled back. My arms stretched on naturally and more pain flared from my wrist to my shoulder. I thought it was going to rip my arm clean off when I heard Matt scream again from inside. He collided with the creature and stabbed the hand that held mine with his pocket knife. The creature's grip loosened and I managed to slip free. The force from my pulling caused me to fall backward off the trails and hit the ground hard. All of my breath escaped my lungs and I laid heaving on the ground, hearing the sounds of a scuffle up in Matt's room. My friend was screaming still, but it wasn't in defiance anymore. It was terror and pain. I got to my feet and stumbled through Matt's backyard and around his house. I got to my car, started it, then laid on the horn. Hey, I shouted at the top of my lungs. I'm out here. Within seconds, the front door to Matt's house opened, revealing the thing standing there. Now that I had its attention, I put my car in reverse and peeled out of Matt's driveway before bolting it down the road. I checked the rearview mirror, but didn't see it following me, which I took as a good thing. I drove for as long as my gas tank would let me. It was about 8 a.m. when I had to pull over for gas in a town I'd never seen before. Now in broad daylight with minimal people around, I took a second to sift through my bag. I found a granola bar, ate it, then went out and paid for some gas. Once I was filled up, I continued my journey for another couple hours until coming to a rest stop at about 10 a.m. I went inside, bought myself a lunch, and withdrew every penny I could from my bank accounts. Then, with cash in hand, I kept going. After a few more hours, I found a wayside and pulled over. I wasn't particularly tired, but I had to take a break from driving, and figured this random wayside would be devoid of people for a while. I leaned back in my seat and rubbed my forehead. I reached into the bag for another snack, but my head brushed against something soft and rubbery. Confused, I pulled it out and remembered Matt's old switch was in a cheap carrying case. With nothing better to do, I opened up the case and took out the console. That's when I noticed the cracks along the screen and realized I must have landed on it while I fell from the window. My heart sank as I stared into my own fractured reflection. I prayed that it still worked and turned it on. The screen came to life with the Nintendo Switch logo, and not too long after showed a perfectly clear menu. I breathed a sigh of relief and hoped that this was a sign Matt himself was okay. 
Unfortunately, I'd left my phone charging in his room the night before, so I had no way to find out what had happened. For the rest of the night, I oscillated between playing games and sitting on the trunk of my car. There wasn't much else to do, since I didn't want to drive anymore. The one night I'd had to plan was wasted, so I took the time to plan out my next move, but was too tired to really think of anything solid. I went to bed just as the sun began to set. When I woke up the next morning, a dense fog had settled in the area around the wayside. I couldn't see hardly 30 feet in front of me. The air was cool when I got out, though, and it felt really good to stretch my legs. I soaked in the silence. Thankful at first, but then it hit me that everything was too quiet. There were no bird songs, no bugs buzzing, and nothing rustled in the forest next to the wayside. Even the wind was calm. A steely fear crept into my veins, and I quickly got back into my car. The automatic headlights came to life with the engine, and their sudden brightness pulled my eyes to the front of the car. I switched them to the fog light setting and was about to put the car in drive when a dull smack radiated from my passenger window. The steely fear I felt before turned to ice, freezing me in place. It was stupid to look, I know. I should have just drove off and never looked back, but people are curious creatures, so I did look. On the other side of the window was the Gazitstieb. It was still possessing Matt's mom from what I could tell. Her pajamas were covered in mud and blood, scratches and cuts clearly visible across every inch of its body. It had one hand coated with dried blood pressed against the glass. Everything else about it was as you'd expect. Only this time, it had a face. It had taken the skin off of another person's head and stuck it onto its own head like a sick mask. It had facial features, like a mouth and eye sockets, but beneath them was just bare flesh. My breath froze in my throat as it reached up with another hand and pushed up the corners of the mouth, forming a smile. That's when I recognized the face of my best friend. His smile was undeniable. I don't remember much after that. Just a lot of pavement through teary eyes. Over the next few years, I traveled the country, working odd jobs that paid cash while sleeping in my car. It was during one of these jobs that a co-worker of mine mentioned a job opportunity in Alaska. I was hesitant at first, but then I remembered the creature's aversion to cold. Nowhere in the U.S. was colder than Alaska. So I asked him for more details, and he got me in touch with the guy running everything. Suddenly, I had plans to travel to Alaska in a couple weeks. During this time, I decided against my better judgment to head back to Riverstone. It had been a long time since I was there, and I knew I'd probably never get to go back once I was in Alaska. So I went. I went to Matt's house first. The cars out front looked like his parents, but they were both caked with dirt. The grass had also grown very unkempt, as if it hadn't been cut in months. All of the shades were pulled down, blocking me from seeing inside. Not that I wanted to, of course. Then I went to my old house. It was abandoned, but not totally destroyed. All the doors and windows were boarded up, trash littered the yard, and the grass looked just like Matt's. Otherwise, it was as it had been the day I left. I looked up to where my bedroom had been on the second floor and felt a tug in my heart at the memories. Jake? A female voice said from my right. I looked over and saw a girl who looked vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place a name to her face. She wore an olive green sweater with black jeans and a beat up pair of vans. Her hair was blonde and she wore glasses in front of her sea green eyes. Don't recognize me? She asked, taking a step forward. No, I'm sorry, I said leaning back against my car. Jake, it's me, Kylie. Immediately I recognized her. Though when I last saw her, she wore band tees and had jet black hair. I guess the blonde was her natural color. 
Oh my god, Kylie. I began standing up straighter. It's okay, she said, holding up a hand. I'm not mad at you. Uh, I'm sorry, was all I could say. She pursed her lips and looked down at her shoes. You know, he called me that night, she said, looking back up to me. When you were driving to his house, he called me. He told me what was going on and was unsure about letting you stay. I told him he was being ridiculous and that it was just one night. She sniffled and tears welled up in her eyes. He said he wanted to go with you, she continued. Said he didn't want you to face this alone, but he was afraid of leaving me behind. Her sobbing grew stronger, and she placed her head in her hands, muffling the tears. I just stood in silence. As afraid of that thing as he was, she continued after a few moments. He knew he'd never live with himself if he didn't help you, so I told him to go. I told him to help you. Another pause. That was the last time I spoke to him, she finished. She wiped a few tears from her face and I offered her some tissues that I kept in my glove box. Once she was composed, I spoke. What are you doing here? I asked as kindly as I could. I figured you'd be over at Matt's. His parents don't want to see me anymore, she said. I told them what I just told you and they didn't take it too well. And their house isn't abandoned. Yours is. I come here to make sure no one has vandalized it. I appreciate that. Another silence passed between us while Kylie composed herself a bit. I'm sorry. I know it was a while ago, but it still hurts. She said. Believe me, I get it. I replied, glancing back at my old house. So why are you here? She asked. I explained how I'd been living the past few years, the job in Alaska, and my desire to see the town one last time. I left out the part about the Gazitsteeb and Matt's face. Wow, was all she could say, turning to look at the house with me. Kylie and I had never been super close. We only knew each other through Matt since they were dating. In that moment, though, we were both walking down our own memory lanes, each slightly different, but both rooted in my old house and Matt's life. I remembered coming home from school with Matt by my side as we ran to my room to play Xbox. I remembered riding our bikes through town, stopping at various parks to just hang out and talk with our friends. I remembered sitting with Matt at Bury Park talking about anything and everything that came to our minds until the sun was setting and we had to leave before it got dark. Everything was much simpler then. In the blink of an eye, it was all over, and years stood between now and then, an impossibly long distance. A familiar chill ran down my back, pulling me out of my memories. I looked to my right, at the nearest street corner and saw the creature there. It's taken over some poor woman who'd been walking her dog. The animal tugged on its leash, urging the woman forward, but the Gazitsteeb didn't budge an inch. Despite its ghastly appearance, which I'd grown accustomed to, the thing didn't have any malice in its glare, like it was letting me have this moment, but wanted me to know it was still there. Hey, you okay? Kylie asked. It's there, I said, not breaking my stare. In my peripheral vision, I saw Kylie glance over at the woman. She looked for a moment, then turned back. Where? She asked. Right there, I said, that woman walking her dog. Jake, there's no one there. I continued to stare at the creature without saying another word. I could feel Kylie getting tense next to me. But I didn't care. I wasn't going to let this thing scare me off. That's when it did something I would have never seen coming. It reached up with the woman's free hand and placed her index finger and thumb about where the corners of her mouth would be and pushed them up. Panic welled up in my gut and I tore my gaze away from the monster. 
I began shivering like it was twenty below outside and hunched forward as nausea rolled over me. Jake, are you okay? Kylie asked, placing a hand on my back. I swallowed the impending vomit and took control of my breathing. After a minute or so, I felt good enough to stand back up. I looked over to where the creature had been, and thankfully it was gone. I need to leave, I said. Thank you for watching the house, but it's okay if it rots. I don't care anymore. Kylie stood back and was about to argue, but stopped herself. The look on my face told her I wasn't going to budge. Well, reach out when you get to Alaska, okay? She said. Will do, I replied. Looking back, I feel sort of bad for not following up, but I just can't bring myself to message her. So, Kylie, if you are somehow reading this, I'm sorry. But that brings me back to where this post started. I've been in Alaska for a bit now, and will be heading north soon. The creature has been around, but it seems hesitant now. It's appeared to me from farther away than usual, and hasn't made moves to get closer. Maybe it knows what I'm planning. Regardless, I'm going through with my plans. I can only assume the change in behavior is due to my actions, so pushing onward is the best thing I can do. I won't have an internet connection where I'm going, so don't expect any updates after tomorrow. I wouldn't post even if I did, to be honest. I'd rather leave all of this behind me and try to live my life as best I can, for as long as I can. Matt, I'm sorry for everything. I hope you're at peace, wherever you are. My nine-year-old daughter, Abby has had a weird fear of mythical creatures for a while now. I blame her mother, my ex, for giving her unrestricted access to the internet at a young age. I began to grow tired of constantly having to check under her bed and in her wardrobe for monsters. Every time she stayed at mine for the weekend, and even had to invest in a nightlight for her to sleep. When she was younger, I was understanding. Lots of kids are afraid of the dark and things that go bump in the night, but as the years went on, this started to irritate me. It had gotten to the point where she didn't want to sleep by herself, couldn't sleep in the dark, and absolutely refused to step outside at night. Two weekends ago, Abby and I fell out because she point-blank refused to take the trash out after dinner because it was dark. This led to me growing frustrated as she only had to take five steps out the door, but she dug her heels in. During that week, I decided enough was enough, and planned to take her camping in the forest for the weekend, to get her away from all the nonsense online and face her fears. I ordered Abby some walking shoes, hiking trousers, a thermal jumper, and some cheap t-shirts to pack for the weekend. Abby basically has an entire wardrobe of clothes she keeps here, but I didn't want her to complain if her clothes got dirty or damaged. I left work a bit earlier on Friday to prepare, packing a bag for myself and my daughter for our trip. I loaded up the car and made my way to my ex's house to collect Abby. Abby greeted me at the door, and I held out a carrier bag full of hiking clothes. Hey you, go and put these on. I smiled, handing her the bag. What is it? She asks. Peeking into the bag. Walking gear, I tell her. We're going on an adventure. As Abby ran upstairs to get changed, my ex Martha sauntered to the door, her new partner Steve following behind. Hello, Paul. Hope you're well. Martha smiled half-heartedly, with Steve offering me a nod of hello. We engage in pleasantries for a while, when Martha asked me what our plans were for the weekend. Camping, I tell her in a low voice, under the guise of a brisk hike. Oh, Paul, no. Martha frowns, shaking her head. You know what she's like with the dark. Ah, uh, leave him be, Marth, Steve chimed in. 
giving me a nod of approval. It'll bloody do the girl some good. My father would have done the same. Martha pursed her lips, as if thinking of a counter-argument before her shoulders dropped in defeat. Well, I guess. Just look after her, Paul, she told me sternly. She'll be all right, Steve assured her before I could respond, rubbing her shoulder. Don't you fret. Abby returned to the door not long after. How's it fit? I asked her. Well, the shoes fit fine, she replied, lifting her foot out in front of her. But the trousers are a little long, and the fleece is kind of big. She wasn't wrong, but I put it down to the unpredictability of online shopping. Looks alright to me, Steve said, giving me a final nod farewell before my daughter and I retreated to the car. Dad, this hike's taking ages, Abby whined her arms swinging by her sides. It's only been a couple of hours. Usually you're full of energy. I chuckle. We carry on walking until we reached a large clearing. Here we'll do, I announced, sliding the backpack from my shoulders. Abby looked at me perplexed. For what? The campsite, I smiled. Abby's eyes widened. What? She snapped. Tell me you're joking. Oh, don't be dramatic, I told her. Didn't you catch on when I got this huge bag out of the car? Abby began to panic, explaining to me how it will be dark soon and we need to leave. Hey now, calm down, I assured her gently. We won't make it back to the car before dark anyways. Let's set up camp and we'll get a big fire going. I've brought marshmallows. The tent was up. Baked beans and hot dogs were eaten, and we sat around the campfire with marshmallows on sticks. See? I smiled at her. This isn't so bad. Isn't it nice to be away from screens and pollution? I guess. Want a soda? I asked, pulling two cans of sugary drink from my bag. Abby raised an eyebrow. After seven? You and mom never let me have soda after seven. I nodded. Yeah, I guess you're right. I thought you might want one as a treat. But, like you said... No, Abby yelled playfully as I pretended to put the sodas away. I handed her a can and we both resumed our places at opposite ends of the fire, our sodas letting out a hiss as we pulled the tabs. So how comes you're so scared of the dark? I asked her, pulling my packet of cigarettes from my pocket and lighting one. Abby ran her finger around the rim of her can. You know why. Monsters, I reply. Abby nodded without looking up. Do you believe in monsters? She asked me. I shook my head. Nah, well I mean I don't believe in the kind of monsters you do with the claws and horns. I believe some bad people can be monsters though. I don't believe in those kinds of things. Abby told me. I raised an eyebrow. Uh, so what sorts do you believe in? Abby looked down at her can again, prodding the tab with her finger. Have you ever heard of the hermits? The what? I asked, a slight chuckle escaping my lips. The hermits, my daughter repeated. Can't say I have. Abby pulled her phone from her bag, opening a folder in her picture gallery and handing me the phone. I put my can down next to me and began flicking through. The first image was a drawing of a humanoid creature, but its ears were slightly pointed and its eyes were a pale white with pupils like a snake. It had locks of thin, white, greasy hair. It looked as though its nose had been removed and it was drawn wearing only a white shred of cloth around its groin. The second was a realistic looking image similar to the drawing. It had long, sharp fingernails and was grinning with pointy yellow teeth. It was thin and seemed to hunch over, with grayish skin and a hairless body. This image didn't show it wearing the shredded white cloth. Instead, it appeared to have a small, bulging pouch similar to a kangaroo where a human would have their reproductive parts. 
I scrolled to the next image, which was mostly text with two different sketches of the creature. One looked more male and the other female, with a slightly fattier chest, a pouch that went sideways, and a more flexible hunched over stance. I flicked my finger across the screen to the next image, which showed local statistics of missing children and hikers who vanished without a trace, with some locations and images of victims. What followed this image was a screenshot of a written text. The hermits generally reside in woodlands and farmland where they can easily acquire food. The hermit's usual source of food is bone marrow of larger mammals such as livestock, mainly cattle, horses, deer, and humans. The hermits are attracted to the smell of blood. Some say they can smell it from up to a mile away, although this hasn't yet been proven. The hermits are social predators, which follow similar pack rankings as we give to wolves. The hermits don't tend to follow the usual pack gender rules, with both males and females engaging in similar activities and ranks for both sexes. I continued flicking through the album, which showed more sketches, pictures, and grainy camera footage. Huh, they are pretty creepy, I admitted, but they're not real. There's been all kinds of folklore around since I was a kid. Used to scare me a bit too, but it's just make-believe. Abby frowned at me as I handed her her phone back. It's not fake, Dad. I've seen them. They roamed the woods at the back of the house. I chuckled. That's so. As I moved my arm, a pointy branch from the log I was sitting on snagged the sleeve of my fleece, pulling some of the thread out. Dang it. I hissed, raising my arm to inspect the damage. Abby suddenly jumped up. Did you cut yourself? She squealed. No, no. I just got my fleece caught on a stick. I told her. Abby went into a tirade about checking my arm for cuts to ensure it's not bleeding. They can smell blood. They target the wounded for an easy kill. I looked at her and sighed. Kid, let's just get ready for bed. I turned in my sleeping bag, trying to get comfortable. The dim yellow beam from the flashlight which Abby had insisted we hang from the roof of the tent was all that illuminated our shelter. I was about to drift off when I felt my shoulder being poked. Dad, I need a wee. I turned and sat up in my warm sleeping bag. Okay, go ahead and take the light. Don't go too far. Can you come with me? Abby asked awkwardly. You're plenty old enough to do these things by yourself, I told her, already unzipping my sleeping bag knowing my fate was sealed. I grabbed the flashlight and climbed out of the tent, aiming the light at a large tree. Here, you take the light. Just go behind that tree over there. I turned around and took a deep, tired breath, feeling the crisp air caress my face. My daughter returned, her face pale. Dad, something's wrong. What's wrong? I think... I think I'm bleeding. What? Where? Did you get a scratch? I've got a first aid kit, if it's bad, and... Abby cut me off by pointing to her lap. There. She looked at me visibly upset and uncomfortable. It took me a moment before it clicked. Oh, yeah, no. Don't worry, it's normal. That's just something you get at a certain age. Ugh, what a place for it to happen. I retreated back to the tent to try and find something to help my daughter. Did your mom pack you any toiletries in your weekend bag? I called out to her, dragging my bag out of the tent. Abby shook her head, her eyes beginning to water. Uh, it's, it's okay, it's alright. Don't get upset about it. I assured her gently. I've got a load of tissues and some bandages. That should see you through until we leave. Here, go in the tent and get changed into some clean undies. I'll wait out here. Abby vanished into the tent as I took some deep breaths, hoping I handled the situation okay. Abby came out of the tent a few moments later. I left my weekend bag in the car, she informed me sadly. 
Uh, it'll be okay. I'll wash everything tomorrow whilst you have a nice bath. I smiled. Abby offered me a half-hearted smile before her face fell. They'll smell it. Huh? The hermits. They won't. Let's try to get some sleep. I was woken by a scream. I sat upright looking in the darkness at my daughter's sleeping bag. It was empty. I fought my way out of the sleeping bag and dove out of the open tent. Abby? Abby? I shouted looking around. I spotted the beam of a flashlight coming from behind the large tree Abby had used earlier and ran over. Abs, are you okay? Abby didn't reply, her shaking hand pointing the light into the tree line. I slowly took the flashlight from her trembling palm, rubbing her shoulders reassuringly. Sweetie, what happened? I, I dropped my bracelet here earlier. I didn't want to wake you, so I thought I'd be brave and go get it. Abby's voice shook with fear as she pinched her bracelet between her fingers tightly. Why did you scream? Did something scare you? I asked her, gently taking the bracelet from her fingers and putting it in my pocket. I expected her to say she heard a twig snap or an animal call. Abby slowly pointed in front of us. It's behind the tree. Confused, I raised the light to where she was pointing, just in time to see a figure step backwards out of sight. What the... I said out loud, a mixture of fear and anger in my voice. Before I could think, I called out into the night, demanding to know who was out there. Abby clung to my waist as we stood frozen in place. Daddy? Before Abby could say anything... A large branch snapping behind us caused us to spin around. I shone the light in all directions, unable to see anything. A screech rang out from the trees as we heard twigs snap all around us. Let's go back to the tent, I whisper. Looking back, I feel the shelter was a false sense of security, but I knew I had a small survival knife in my bag. We slowly walked backwards towards the tent. Small embers of our fire offering the campsite a hint of light. My daughter began walking backwards to the tent when I grabbed her arm. A filthy gray foot slowly disappeared into our tent. Abby gasped, unable to scream due to fear. Time stood still. I could hear my heart thumping in my ears as I held my breath. The crunching sound of a stick behind us was enough to break me from my terrified trance. Run. I hissed, practically dragging my daughter by her arm through the bracken and into the tree line. Screeching rang out behind us, but I didn't look back. I could hear heavy rustling behind us. Daddy, they're in the trees, Abigail screamed. Just keep running, I barked. My eyes locked in front of us. My hand latched tightly to her arm as I pulled her along. Abby tripped, causing my body to jerk and the flashlight to escape my grip. I pulled her back up in a second and we continued fleeing, not wasting any time to pick up our only source of light. I desperately pleaded that this route would lead us back to the car, or at bare least out of danger, but my stomach dropped and I put my foot in front of me to hastily decelerate. The steep edges of a deep ravine lit up by the moonlight trapped us. I hissed, rapidly turning my head in both directions before deciding to continue right. Daddy? Abby cried as I began to tug her, pointing to where I was pulling her. I looked. A long, gray, bony hand with sharp black fingernails slowly disappeared behind a tree in front of us. I stopped, pushing Abby behind me in a protective stance. Branches broke all around us as screeches took over the forest. My daughter gripped my hand as figures began slowly peering at us from behind the trees. Their long, thin, white hair hanging down illuminated in the moonlight, and their eyes reflected light like an animal. A low, rumbling snarl from behind us seemed to silence the forest. I turned my head to see a hunched creature hunting us on all fours. 
its back low to the ground. It got closer, stood on two feet and sniffed the air before looking at my daughter and letting out a gurgling grin. Sharp, yellowed teeth filled its mouth. I pushed Abby behind me, encasing her between my body and a tree. Get back, I yelled, holding my shoulders high. The creature looked at me, its slit pupils growing slightly as it slowly crept into the moonlight. Daddy? Abigail screamed. I turned around to see a long gray arm latched to my daughter's waist, trying to pull her up the tree. I began punching, clawing, and twisting the arm, desperately trying to pry it from my daughter. I suddenly felt a heavy impact on my back and I began falling. The creatures in the moonlight had hit me so hard I'd been thrown into the ravine. My body bashed against the rocky edges of the ravine as I rolled down the muddy edges and into an ankle-deep stream below. I tripped on rocks as I fought to stand, a sharp pain in my foot as I twisted, it falling. The screams of my daughter rang out from above. I desperately clawed at the edges of the ravine, grabbing at roots and rocks to climb back up, but I couldn't. Abigail, I screamed helplessly scraping my fingernails across the rocks and frantically seeking for somewhere to climb. The trees rustled and branches creaked from above me, the screeches of the creatures and my daughter's cries beginning to grow faint. Daddy! No, no, Abigail! I walked through the ravine until morning light, when I found a spot I could climb. Dazed, I blinked into the sunrise. I continued briskly limping until I got to my car, plucking my car keys from my fleece pocket and collapsing into the driver's seat. I punched the steering wheel, tears welling up in my eyes as I turned the key in the ignition and began speeding into town. I filed a police report. Police didn't believe me at first, but eventually confessed they'd had a lot of strange reports from that woods. They believe it's a group of sick individuals in costumes targeting hikers and campers, even though I insisted that's not possible. No trace of Abby has been found. I live in hope that she got away somehow and will someday come back. Our campsite was discovered torn to shreds. Police did a thorough search through the forest and found the skeletal remains of some of the missing hikers. The bones had been snapped and were riddled with teeth marks. Police think an animal got to them. Martha blames me and has since demanded no contact. I can't say I blame her. I couldn't keep our daughter safe. I'll live with that guilt every day. I wish I could go back in time and just stay home that weekend. This story doesn't end with me hearing things in the night or seeing faces at my window. I haven't been to the woods since and keep my house well lit at all times. Abby, if you're out there and you read this, I'm sorry I couldn't protect you. You were my reason to get up every morning, my push to get me through the week, and my reason to smile. Life isn't as bright without you. I've still got your bracelet. I keep it on my nightstand so it's the first thing I see when I wake up and the last thing I see before I go to sleep. Please come back, Abs. I'm scared of cryptids too. Okay, so I know everybody reading this will probably think I'm some nutcase. I'm prepared for that. I just wanted to share this story in case anyone else has experienced anything similar. It all began two months ago. I had recently moved to British Columbia from Washington State for a new work opportunity. I had been interested in Canada and was still relatively close to my friends and family so I took the role and moved to a city called Kelowna. Nature had always appealed to me, and I was excited to move to a place where I could be surrounded by the beautiful scenery of the Okanagan Valley. I'm a pretty anxious guy, and thought this move to a calmer, more scenic location would help me with that. Unfortunately, what didn't help my anxiety was the difficulty in finding a place to rent. 
but after a few weeks I managed to find a place with a great mountain view and a beautiful park within walking distance. While I was correct that the scenery did improve my mood immensely, I'll admit the neighborhood creeped me out. A lot. This should have been my first sign to turn tail and get out. The neighborhood was gorgeous landscape-wise, surrounded by beautiful mountains but still felt ominous at the same time. The residents seemed much older and, by their reactions to my moving truck, not very happy about my being there. Almost all of the houses except for mine seemed run down. Lawns were overgrown, paint was peeling. All the windows seemed to have blinds for curtains. Now and then I would see someone peering out from their blinds, but no one ever came to greet me. Still, it didn't get to me too much since the house I was moving to was newly renovated and the rent was much lower than others on the market. I felt like I got a deal. I settled in and the first three weeks were fine, but still there were constant red flags. Each night when I took out the trash, I would see some of my neighbors sitting out on the porch at 10 p.m. drinking. I didn't find this too out of the ordinary but it always seemed like whenever I would show up, they would instantly stop talking and start looking at me, as if they were talking about me. I know that seems really self-centered, but what would you think if every time you showed up, people stopped talking and started staring? I chose to ignore it. It first happened on the fourth week after I had moved. I had just come back from work, tired and hungry. I made some TV dinner and decided maybe it was time I got to sleep early for once. I turned off the lights and promptly went upstairs. It wasn't more than a few hours into sleep when I heard it. Click, click, click. At first it sounded like something was knocking at the window. I wasn't fully awake but the noise was getting louder. I thought it was coming from outside. Maybe a raccoon was jumping on the roof. But then my heart sank as I slowly came to the realization. It was my doorknob. Someone was trying to get in. It almost felt like my mind was red though because as soon as I realized this, it stopped. I was paralyzed with fear that whoever did that might come back. After a while I mustered up the courage to rush out and turn on the lights. I yanked open the door but obviously no one was there. I turned on all the lights in the house and went to check the door, but it had been locked the whole time. The windows were all closed and locked as well. I felt my stomach drop. There had to have been some squatter from previous years still living in the house. I barricaded my door and tried to go to sleep. I woke up early the next day and started scouring the entire house, and I mean inch by inch. When I was done, I started checking the walls to see if there were any cracks or hidden entrances. None. I was doubting myself at that point. Maybe I had dreamt it, or maybe it was some weird version of sleep paralysis. Obviously, I wasn't fully awake at the time, and I'd had wacky dreams before, but maybe this was just one of them, or maybe the door just does that sometimes. I couldn't really come up with an explanation. I had thoroughly checked the house and found nothing. I wasn't sure what to make of it. I tried to move on, but due to paranoia and a mix of fear, I decided to set up a lock in my room so it could be locked from the inside. Things went back to normal, and I didn't notice anything strange for a bit. That was until I noticed that for some reason, in the morning, the door to my room would be unlocked. At first, I thought maybe I had forgotten to lock it. So the next night, I made sure to actually lock it. I woke up the next morning and, lo and behold, it was unlocked. Now I knew something was going on. No more doubts. I decided then I would stay up and confront whoever the squatter was, or at least find out what was going on with my door. I bought some energy drinks and got ready. I turned off all the lights, drank my energy drinks, and locked the doors to get ready for the long night. Time crawled as I kept watch, trying to pass the time, but every minute felt like a thousand. Time was moving so slowly that it felt like morning would never come. 
After about two hours, my bladder started filling up and I started taking more trips to the bathroom. I was worried this would scare off my potential squatter, but I had no choice. I kept waiting and kept drinking energy drinks to stay away, but at this point, it was 3 a.m. and still no sign. I was starting to worry this whole thing might have been for nothing. That was until I had to take another quick trip to the bathroom. I finished and started to head back to the room. That was when I saw it. Just then, as I was walking in the hallway, someone, or to be honest, I should say something was walking up the stairs. My skin instantly went cold as my heart leapt up in my throat. There was no sound. It moved without touching the stairs. But as it was turning the corner for the second flight, it saw me and stopped. That was when I realized this wasn't a squatter at all. It was pure black. Almost as if it was a shadow that came to life. It had the outline of a person, but it didn't seem very human. It was much too small. The outline of its head seemed entirely too big for its body, and the arms much too short. It had no face, but I knew it was staring right at me. I could feel cold sweat dripping at this point. Then it started moving towards me. It was slow, but its movements felt very fast. It seemed to float up the steps. I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't breathe. My body refused to respond. At this point, it was four to six feet ahead of me, and that was when I somehow broke out of my paralysis. I quickly turned on the light in the hallway, but inadvertently blinded myself for a second as my eyes took a moment to adjust. But just when I was able to see again, it was gone. I knew I wasn't going crazy. I knew what I saw. I bolted downstairs, turned on all the lights, and started looking around the house. Then I rushed outside to see if I could find anything. Nothing. But I spotted something else. It wasn't clear at first since it was still dark, but the street lamps illuminated just enough to spot something that brought back that terrible feeling I had just felt. I saw someone peering out from the blinds. I thought it was just one of my neighbors, but as I looked around, I spotted one, two, three, four. Almost the entire neighborhood was watching me at 4 a.m. stumbling outside. And I knew it wasn't because of any noise because I had made absolutely none while looking outside. All I did was open the door and come out. It was almost as if they had been awake too, expecting me to come outside. Why else would almost the entire neighborhood be awake at 4 a.m. watching me? I walked in the middle of the street looking directly at them as they watched me, but no one took a step back. They just kept watching. And the way they were looking at me wasn't just out of neighborly curiosity. It was different. It was like they were privy to something I didn't know. Like I said, I can be somewhat prone to anxiety and paranoia. But even I could tell there was something else going on here. I went back inside, locked the doors, and just stayed in the living room for the remainder of the night with all the lights on until the sun came up. The next day, I got all my belongings, put them in a suitcase, and started renting a hotel. I didn't care how many months were left on my lease, or how much it would cost to break it. I just... left. I don't have anyone else to talk to about this. I don't have any friends, family, or even acquaintances. When I ran away with Dan, I thought I was moving towards a better part of my life. I was going to be more grand, more promiscuous, and more exotic, but I can't. I arrived at the house just after dark. It was smaller than I remembered, hunched beneath a sky the color of ash. The realtor had called it quaint, but... Now all I saw was decay. The paint, once white, peeled like dead skin, curling back from the wood in long, brittle strips. The windows were clouded with dirt, like they hadn't been touched in years. 
I wanted peace, solitude, but as I stood there staring at the house, I felt the air grow heavy, pressing in on me. Grief does strange things to your mind, I thought. I hadn't been myself since Dan's accident. His death left a gaping hole inside me, and this place, this forsaken house, was supposed to be a refuge, a place to escape to grieve in silence, but the longer I looked at it, the more I felt something was wrong. I shook the feeling, telling myself it was just the exhaustion. I dragged my suitcase inside and shut the door, the echo of the slam too loud in the empty rooms. The house smelled like damp wood and old memories, stale and suffocating. I unpacked slowly, my hands numb, mind drifting. That first night I slept fitfully, wrapped in Dan's old sweatshirt. The wind outside howled like a wild animal, scratching at the windows. I thought I heard footsteps in the hallway around midnight. Slow, deliberate. But when I forced myself out of bed to check, there was nothing. Just silence, thick and oppressive. By morning I convinced myself it had been a dream. Days bled into each other. I wandered the empty rooms, the floors creaking beneath my weight, each groan sounding like the house's whispering voice. Objects started disappearing, small things at first, a spoon, a pen, my keys. I brushed it off, telling myself I was just forgetful. Grief does that to you. I'd forget my own name if I didn't say it out loud sometimes. But the mirror, that was harder to ignore. It started with glances, catching the corner of my reflection when I wasn't looking at it. I'd be in the kitchen washing dishes, and out of the corner of my eye I'd see something move in the hall mirror. At first I thought it was just my reflection, delayed somehow, but it wasn't. One night as I passed the mirror, I saw her, me, standing there staring back. Only she wasn't copying me. I froze, my heart thudding painfully in my chest. My reflection stood still, her face slack, eyes wide and dull. She was waiting, watching. I reached a trembling hand toward the glass, but before I could touch it, she moved. Not a blink, not a shift in weight, just a sudden, violent jerk. Her hand shot up to the glass, slamming against it with a sickening thud. I screamed and stumbled back, but when I looked again, my reflection was normal. A terrified, pale version of myself. I backed away, avoiding the mirror for the rest of the night. Every muscle in my body wound tight, waiting for something to happen. But nothing did. Not yet. The next day, I started hearing the voice. It whispered, faint at first, almost like a breeze, but when it grew louder, clearer, it was Dan. I was sure of it. His voice soft and familiar, coming from the walls, the floors, the cracks in the wood. He was calling me, telling me he wasn't gone, that he was trapped here with me. I wanted to believe it. God, I wanted it so badly. The grief in me ached, tearing at the seams. I spent hours sitting in the dark, listening for him, begging for more, but all I got were whispers taunting, cruel. The voice turned from gentle to accusing, blaming me for his death, telling me I had abandoned him. You let me die, he hissed through the walls. You should be with me. Come back to me. I tried to shut it out, but it followed me from room to room. The objects that had disappeared started showing up in strange places on the bed, in the fridge, inside my shoes. Things I didn't even own appeared in the house. An old pocket watch, a child stuffed bear, a photograph of someone I didn't know. Their eyes scratched out. The mirror was the worst. Every time I passed it, she was there, my reflection. But she wasn't me anymore. Her eyes followed me, tracking my movements. She smiled when I wasn't looking, a cold, mocking grin that stretched too wide. I tried covering the mirror with a sheet, but every time I left the room, the sheet would be on the floor when I returned. 
the glass gleaming as if nothing had been there at all. By now I was hardly sleeping. The voice never stopped. My reflection never looked away. Then last night, it happened. I woke to the sound of glass shattering. Heart racing, I sat up in bed, blinking in the dark. The mirror, I knew it before I even stepped into the hallway. I could feel it like a heartbeat pulsing in the walls. The mirror was broken, shards scattered across the floor, but in the middle of the glass stood a figure, tall and dark, shifting like a shadow made of flesh. It smiled at me, my reflection, no longer behind the glass but standing in my home, dripping with something dark and sticky. I tried to scream, but the sound lodged in my throat as she moved closer, her smile splitting her face in two, wide and grotesque. Come with me, she whispered, her voice like shattered glass. Come be with him. I ran, but the house twisted around me, the walls groaning as they stretched and warped. I could hear her behind me, her footsteps quick and sharp like the ticking of a clock. Closer, closer. Now I'm here, hiding in the attic, my back pressed against the cold wood. The whispers are louder. Dan's voice mingling with hers, calling me, telling me to give in, to join them. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. The door is creaking open, and the mirror is gone. I think she is too. She dropped her cigarette and crushed it out with her foot. Shocking because she was barefoot, and yet not shocking, because it was Julie Byers. She was a frail, gaunt woman. Her arms and legs were wire thin. Her shrunken face was dwarfed by her large forehead and fringed with matted, blonde, curly hair. Julie was homeless, but lived with everyone. She hopped from trailer to trailer, spending a week or so in one home, wearing out her welcome and then moving on to another. She had the tenacity of a cocaine-addled salesman, knocking on doors, camping out on front porches, begging and pleading for entrance. Resisting her was futile. Calling the police, useless. She was persistently introducing herself as if no one knew who she was or had even perceived that she had existed. An existence such as hers was too irritating and obnoxious not to notice. Her presence was abrupt and unwelcomed. Someone had dropped her off in the trailer park like an unwanted mutt, and she was too dumb to find her way out. I had been lucky. She had never thought to grace me with her presence. Maybe it was me. I'm not very sociable. When I see her, I do my best to avoid her. Maybe it was my trailer. Not the nicest on the lot. A bare-bones trailer with a set of stairs and a driveway. Not much more. I'm not one for landscaping or deck building, or even home maintenance in general. The less I build or accentuate, the less I have to take care of. Or maybe it was my neighbor, Mr. Greer. A mean old guy that smelled like rotten eggs and whiskey, never ventured further than his own lawn chair. He'd sit there all day at the edge of his driveway with a scowl on his face. He hated life in general, but had a special disgust for people, and especially Julie Byers. Pitiful, he would say every time he saw her. A favorite platitude of his. It was consistent and frequent like a grumpy, old, fat parrot. I confronted him on one occasion to no avail. I cared little for Julie, but the spite was a little overboard and frankly, it made me mad. Yeah, she was down and out, struggling, but she was a person worthy of human dignity. I had never really expressed those sorts of sentiments before, probably something I heard on a sitcom. He was unaffected by my emotional appeal. She's worthless. Pitiful. All right, enough. Give it a rest. You can keep your mouth shut. I'm tired of hearing it. He rolled his eyes towards me without moving his head. 
I saw an unnatural sway of his pupils as they dilated and contracted rapidly to an abrupt focus. I didn't ask your opinion. She's pitiful and doesn't deserve to exist. She's a waste of existence. That was the extent of our conversations. I thereafter resigned to never speak to him again. Fate guaranteed that I wouldn't have to work hard to achieve that goal either. Not long after, Mr. Greer was found dead in his lawn chair. The silly thing is, I saw the guy. I saw him out of the corner of my eye, but I didn't want to turn my head and draw his attention. I just figured he had fallen asleep. Later that night, the flashing lights of an ambulance woke me up. What happened? I asked my neighbor, Angie. Old man died. Right there in his chair. No way. And ever since, that trailer had sat there empty. Three or four months, I gather. No relatives had come by and collected his belongings. No one had come to clean the property or to sell it or to even show it. Management didn't seem to care. If they didn't care, then I sure as hell wouldn't care. I thought it would be nice to have the corner lot to myself. With only one neighbor to my left and rid of that nasty old man. And I guess that's why Julie finally felt safe to approach me and introduce herself. Hey boy, you like movies? She asked me as she started pulling out a pack of cigarettes from her back pocket. I had just pulled up into the driveway coming home from work. I didn't see her until I had shut the car door. If I had seen her in time, I would have kept driving. What's your name? My name is Julie Byers. Some folks call me July, being that I'm all sunny and whatnot, an account of my name sounding similar. We ought to watch a movie tonight, me and you. What kind of movies do you like? I like horror movies, but sometimes I'll watch a comedy. What's good is to watch a really scary movie and then watch a comedy after. It balances out your nerves. Although sometimes you can't balance out a really scary movie. I don't care how funny a comedy is. You try to laugh and think about that funny movie, but that scary stuff keeps popping in your head whether you want it to or not. All the while, she's inching forward. I wanted to tell her that I got to go make up something, but I couldn't get a word in edgewise. She's masterful at this game. She knew I wanted to ditch her. She knew she wasn't welcomed, but she didn't care. The screen door on Mr. Greer's trailer swung open and slammed shut. We both turned and looked. It swung open again, but not in a smooth mechanical motion as if blown by the wind, but in a deliberate way to signify anger. An angry swing. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what I saw. Julie saw it too. She shook and trembled. He's still there. He don't like me. It happened several more times, swinging out slowly then slamming shut. By this time, she was up on my stairs and after one more vicious slam, she flung her arms around me and buried her head in my chest. I fumbled for my keys and opened the door. She unleashed me and hopped inside the trailer. I didn't have the heart to throw her out. It's just the wind. Maybe a good comedy will make it go away. We watched several movies, her on the couch and me in my recliner. She talked incessantly. She narrated the scenes as they happened and provided a full commentary at the end of each movie. I fell asleep during the middle of the last movie drifting off to a cacophony of slapstick shenanigans with slide whistles and kazoos and her nonsensical babbling. I was awakened by a chilly breeze and an unexpected moment of silence. The television had been turned off, the front door was open, and the screen door was tapping against the exterior wall. A moderate wind was blowing through the night air. Julie was gone. I can't even begin to express the joy and relief that welled up inside of my soul. I felt like I had been freed from prison, able to do as I pleased. I went to close the door, somewhat miffed that she would just leave it wide open. As I reached out to grab the screen door, I noticed Julie standing on Mr. Greer's front porch. She was staring into the trailer, stiff and unmoving. Julie, I yelled. 
No response. Her gaze affixed. Come back inside. What are you doing? Aggravated, I jumped off the porch and stomped across the lawn. I got to the bottom of the stairs. The inside was dark, but there was a patch of moonlight coming through the back bedroom window. Julie noticed nothing. As I grabbed the rail to climb the stairs, she started to lift off the porch and float. There was an audible hum vibrating throughout, shaking the trailer and causing the metal railing to ring so slightly. Before I could pull my hand away from the railing, I felt a piercing shock of electricity. A shadow moved into the moonlight, an eclipse both obscuring and illuminating. A corona of a tall, slender silhouette, skinnier than humanly possible, taller than the inside of a trailer would allow. A quick glimpse of an alien or a demon, of which I didn't know, but I suspected it wasn't human. Julie's body was yanked into the trailer. The door slammed shut. The hum faded. I was hampered by an immense fear and yet burdened by an overwhelming sense of guilt. After about an hour debating with myself, in the relative safety of my own home, I decided against calling the police and acting on my own. They would think me a madman if I explained that my vagrant neighbor had just been lifted off the ground and abducted by an unseen force. The other consideration was how was I even to fight such a force. Maybe a stealthy getaway. Avoid a confrontation altogether. That was my plan. Sneak in, grab Julie, and get the hell out of there. I grabbed an old rusty fillet knife from my toolbox. A knife I had neglected for years, but still sharp enough to cut hoses and other miscellaneous stuff I needed cutting. Not too sanitary for cleaning fish, but not beyond usefulness. With my fillet knife and a small step ladder, I made my way to the solitary window at the back of Mr. Greer's trailer. I surmised it was probably the window over the kitchen sink and the entrance where my presence would be least expected. I folded out the stepladder and placed it right up against the trailer wall. The window was unlocked and easily pushed open. I peered inside, but the darkness was unusually opaque. Not a sliver of light or even a tinge of gray. The light from outside seemed to be absorbed into the darkness, destroyed as soon as it reached the interior. At once, I felt a need to go back and get a flashlight. But then I would make my presence known. Still, I wasn't too keen on stumbling around in the dark chasing after a chatty cat who may have been killed by some mystical evil force. A force not likely to be easily injured by a fillet knife. I was frightened by a sudden moan for help. I heard Julie to the left in a distant corner of the trailer. The thought of calling the police intruded upon my mind. Guns. They had guns, far more effective than my knife. Please help me, she said in a strained and weak voice. It's asleep. I didn't move, but she knew I was there. It's asleep. That was her way of telling me that this was my only chance to save her, that the window of opportunity was closing fast and there was no time for calling the police. I needed to take action right then and there. I slid in head first, my chest moving across the faucet. I felt a thin pipe bend forward as it pushed hard into my skin. I tried to move away, but the window was too narrow. I had no choice but to push through the pain and hopefully fall to the floor without making a sound. I shimmied across the faucet and onto the floor. The floor was ice cold, so cold it burnt my hands. It reminded me of the time I changed out a propane tank and didn't close the valve. The liquid gas shot out across my bare hand. It was a burning cold, a fierce, sharp piercing of the skin. I pulled my hands back from the floor and quickly stood up. There would be no crawling on my hands and knees. Even though the floor was frozen, the air was hot and humid. Beads of sweat dripped from my forehead while my toes were stiff and numb. I lost my bearings and considered calling out to Julie. The darkness had confused me, and my mind was preoccupied with the discomfort of experiencing both extreme cold and extreme heat. It's asleep. 
Julie? I whispered. Here, she whispered back. I slinked towards Julie's voice, picking my feet up high as I made my way, the cold becoming unbearable. Julie reached out and touched me on the shoulder. I reached up to grab her hand, but instead of her hand, I grabbed her foot. I moved my hand up her leg, trying to understand where she was in relation to myself. Somehow, she was above me. The lights flashed on, and standing before me was a sight I struggled to comprehend or explain. Julie was indeed above me, not floating, not on a ladder, but half submerged in the chest of a large alien being. Her right side and head dangled uncontrollably as the beast started to wake up and shake about in anger. This thing was incomplete in the midst of transformation. It had no legs, only a column with a partial cleavage in the middle, through which I could see the wall behind. The bottom of the column was splayed out like a tree root system, each appendage having spiked hooks firmly entrenched into the floor. The beast's torso and upper body looked human, except that everything was exaggerated. The arms were longer than the length of its body. It had six long fingers on each hand that got excessively thinner near the end. Its skin looked like a translucent wax, revealing a detailed picture of its growing internal organs, lungs, stomach, and several hearts mostly incomplete. Little streaks of lightning were flashing throughout its body. Yet the worst feature, the one that haunts me to this day, was its head. The right side was blank and devoid of form, but the left looked like a burgeoning, grotesque portrait of Julie, an unfinished statue. Help, Julie whispered with exhaustion. Her pitiful eyes communicated a helplessness I had never encountered. An odd thought popped into my head. Had anyone ever been kind to her? I took the fillet knife and started stabbing the beast wherever I could. A flash of fire burnt my hands. A grayish thick fluid exploded into the air, combusting as it came through the skin, cauterizing the beast's wounds. It swung its arm and knocked me across the trailer, which I hadn't noticed until at that time that it was empty. I had expected to fall into a chair or a dining room table. Instead, I hit the side wall and fell to the floor. The air became charged, and I saw the hair on my arm stand on end. My body lifted off the ground. Throughout the creature's body, streaks of what I could only describe as black lightning cascaded from its head to its lower extremities. I was tossed violently to the other side of the trailer, hitting my head so hard against the wall that I cracked the paneling. Spots blurred my vision and I felt dizzy and nauseous, close to losing consciousness. The beast inhaled and straightened up its posture. It strained with all its effort to pull Julie further in. Her head sunk into its chest. I heard her scream loud at first, but then muffled as she was suffocated within the beast's body. Her arm flailed around, grasping and clawing for freedom, and then suddenly stopped. I knew I had failed, and at that point, all I could do was to save myself. I hurried up off the floor and jumped back through the window I entered, landing face first in the stepladder. My nose gushed blood, surprisingly, and luckily, the beast was unconcerned with my escape. I ran to my car, unwilling and probably incapable of feeling safe in my own trailer. I drove around for hours trying to comprehend what had just happened. I listened to the radio and sometimes when a good song came on, I could pretend I was somewhere else and nothing had ever happened, but it wouldn't last. I knew I wouldn't have to report Julie missing. No one cared, probably her family even less. As the sun came up, I grew tired. My body could take no more. I knew I had to get some sleep, especially when I fell asleep in one lane and woke up in another. I had no place to go but home. As I drove up to my trailer, I spotted Julie sitting outside in a lawn chair at the edge of Mr. Greer's driveway. My mind was racing for an explanation. Did she survive? Did any of that even take place? I didn't pursue an explanation, nor did I approach her, at least not on that day.
Several weeks passed, and it was the same routine. I'd wake up, Julie would be at the end of the driveway, come home, still there. Finally, one day after work, I approached her. It was a cringe thing to say, but I'm not known for my charm. Seen any good horror movies lately? She looked up at me with a scowl on her face. What are you talking about? She looked like Julie, but sounded like Mr. Greer. Her breath smelled like rotten eggs and whiskey. I quickly walked away. I wanted to know about the trailer and Julie's new living arrangement. I was blunt about it and asked the manager why they were letting Julie live there. I was hoping he would commit to throwing her off the premises. Curiously, the manager said that Mr. Greer had left everything he owned to Julie, which consisted of one trailer and one lawn chair. My stepdad, Carl, hates me. There's just no other way to put it. Matt, if you don't like it, go and live with your dad. Carl would yell, squinting at me through his wire-rimmed glasses, arms folded. I don't know where he is, though. I don't know him. He left me when I was seven. I'd reply. That's not my problem, is it? I'm the breadwinner in this household, so if you want to live here, you'll do as I say. The chore schedule is strict. Sweeping, doing the dishes, washing the car, dusting, vacuuming. Invariably, Carl would find some fault with the quality of my work and call a house meeting to make clear that the piece of gravel he found on the kitchen floor was not acceptable. Had I even done the chores at all? Or was I lying? My mom would sit there, eyes downcast, letting him get through his spiel. Evie, his daughter, my stepsister, would hover by the doorway, waiting to dash out of the room when he'd had his say. I'd learned long ago that there is no way to win the argument, so I'm deferential and apologize, and say it'll never happen again. But it will. When he's out at his job as a mobile mechanic, I say as much to my mom, and she's well aware. He has his flaws, but he's practical, and in his heart, he's good. He's been the closest thing you've had to a father, Matt. He took that responsibility when he didn't have to, she'd say soothingly. In your heart, you're good, but you don't treat Evie like he treats me, I'd respond. Evie has a mother who shares the burden. It isn't my fault my dad ran away. That's how the conversation goes. Around and around in circles. In fairness, my stepdad can be pretty mean to Evie, too. He restricts our internet access. He doesn't let us have sugary snacks. He makes us lock our phones away in a cupboard at 9 p.m. sharp and sends us to bed. He bangs on the bathroom door if he deems we've been in the shower too long. As a result, Evie and I have bonded. The rules push us together. And we've got a genuine friendship. She appreciates that I'm more hard done by, so she'll smuggle me biscuits and tell me the Wi-Fi password if she's managed to weasel the information out of Carl. Needless to say, the rules are subject to a degree of flexibility. He buys chocolate biscuits and Doritos for himself and can munch a whole bag in a night, spilling crumbs over the sofa he sprawled out on. I can hear the TV blaring till midnight sometimes, the drone being broken only by his guffaws. Strict and baleful as he is, he has never laid a finger on any of us. Instead, he smashes objects and writes notes in a capitalized font on the back of envelopes for me to discover in a morning. He screams and shouts in my face, sending the sour stench of his breath my way. I wonder if he's trying to provoke me to hit him, which would be absurd. He's pushing two meters tall and heavy set, and I'm a skinny 17-year-old who's far more interested in reading about battles than fighting them. I'm used to his dramatic outbursts now, so that's why yesterday was so weird. Carl was trying to fix the pipes under the kitchen sink, while Evie pressed him for extra pocket money. 
He was grumbling and largely ignoring her until she mentioned something about the chest in the basement. Carl stopped his tinkering and slid out from under the counter. He towered over Evie, ominously silent. I was studying at the kitchen table but stopped to watch. Carl's face, usually so snarling and pained when he was angry, was utterly blank. What did you say? He whispered. Uh, I was joking. I said I could sell that old chest in the basement to get some pocket money. I'll say this once, Evie. You leave my chest alone. His eyes, cold as frozen planets, bore into Evie's for a moment longer. Then he went back to work. Evie left the room sobbing. I followed her up to her bedroom, where she was crying into one of her old teddies. I thought I'd be doing him a favor. It's full of his army clothes. People buy that sort of stuff nowadays, don't they? And it'd clear up some space. I was trying to be nice. I put my arm around her. I know, Evie. I said. Two years younger than me, and less beaten down. Evie's heart was more open to assault. Still, the coldness of Carl's fury had shocked me. Screw him, screw him, screw him. She screamed into her teddy. Say, Evie, shall we see what's in Carl's chest tonight? 3 a.m.? She looked at me with vengeful, red-rimmed eyes and nodded. I played on her heightened emotions a little, I'll admit. But the way Carl reacted had me genuinely worried about what he had in that chest. If it was anything that could endanger my mom or Evie, I had to know. The evening passed. Evie and I completed our chores, and I read for an hour before surrendering my mobile phone. I said goodnight to Carl and my mom, and only got one response. It's not worth pointing out who ignored me and who replied. I climbed the stairs and closed my bedroom door. It was far too early to sleep, despite what Carl thought, so I read by lamplight every night until my eyes got tired. The only thing to be wary of were slow creaking noises that might indicate Carl was creeping up the stairs. Reading in bedrooms was also banned, and publicly, neither me nor Evie did it. However, Carl had his suspicions, so he'd climb with stealth to a certain point on the stairs to check for a glow beneath either of our bedroom doors. If he saw a light, he'd burst into the room hoping to catch us. Therefore, I'd preemptively switch off the lamp and pretend to be asleep at the sound of any unusual noise. Once a military man, always a military man, I guess. Carl had spent a decade in the army as an engineer. He'd been deployed multiple times, but never to an active theater of war. Bowing to his ex-wife's demands, he'd returned to civilian life a year after Evie's birth. Everything I'd been able to glean seemed to indicate Carl had enjoyed his time in the military. The problem is that he never talks about it. He smiles absently, and his eyes go somewhere far away. What had he seen? What had he done? I woke to a gentle tapping at the door. It was time. Follow my steps, Evie whispered. She'd charted the least creaky path down the stairs, it seemed. We reached the stone slabs of the kitchen floor and gently opened the basement door, careful of squealing hinges. I closed the door behind us and turned on the flickering light. Pressing against the dusty, cobweb-ridden walls, we descended. The basement itself was cramped and filled with tools, shelves, bicycles, shoes, boxes. Evie pulled a picnic blanket off of a bulky mass to reveal a mahogany chest that was curiously dust-free. He comes down here most nights, you know, she said. Why? Evie shrugged and nudged a coated padlock. Do you know the code? I said. Maybe, Evie said, before twisting four numbers into the padlock. It clicked open. Ha! Dad's army serial number. It's full of army crap, so I assumed that'd be it. How do you know it's full of army crap? I asked. He told me once, duh. Or at least I think he did. Let's open it and find out.
The lid was heavier than we expected. It was four inches thick and must have been full of lead. I heaved at one side, and Evie heaved at the other until we got it up. Inside there were no combat fatigues, no dog tags, no boots. It was empty except for two objects. A long black cushion and a human jawbone. Who's there? Evie and I stared at each other, then back at the jawbone. Boy, girl, speak. Can you hear a voice? I asked Evie. Yeah. This isn't army stuff. I don't know what this is. I heard a hollow laugh before the voice continued. He wouldn't have told you about me. His charnel confident. Such is his shame, for he slew me long ago, upon a field far from here. I don't like it, Evie said. Who killed you? I asked the bone. Her father. My dad wouldn't kill anyone. That's a lie, she wailed. Shh, you'll wake them, I whispered. I don't like this. He comes here every night to pray and beg and weep, just as his spawn does. He's certain it was an accident, a firing range mishap, nothing more. Do you believe him? Might he do it again? I hate this, Evie said, and went to close the lid, but I held her back, chewing my lip. Are we in danger? I asked, and that chilly laugh rattled through my head again. Evie broke my grip and lunged for the jawbone perched on the black cushion. You dare touch me? The chest lid slammed shut on Evie's right arm, halfway along the bicep shattering the bone. She let out half a scream before passing out and sliding down the side of the chest. A grisly, grinding sound came from her trapped arm as it twisted further. A cold sweat burst out all over my body and I sprang into action, heaving Evie back up from where she'd fallen. Let her out, let her out. The voice had ceased to reply. Summoning all my strength, I squatted down and pressed the lid up. It didn't budge. I adjusted my grip and pushed with everything I had. A dark centimeter grew into two, then three, then four. I glimpsed that grinning bone perched on black velvet before Evie's mangled arm was free, and she slid back onto the basement floor. I let the lid thud shut. I helped her up the basement stairs, fully intending to wake my mom and Carl up because Evie needed to go to the hospital. She was delirious and muttering. When we emerged, she looked at me, her face white as chalk. Run up the stairs. I was sleepwalking, I fell, she said. It took me a moment to realize what she was doing. Carl would question my role in his daughter's injury. Despite her agony, she'd hatched a plan to protect me from his wrath. I nodded and stamped up the stairs as loud as I could before dashing into my bedroom and closing the door. I leapt into bed just as Evie started yelling from the foot of the stairs. Today has been quiet with everyone at the hospital. At some point, I'll go into the basement and cover the chest with the picnic blanket and sweep some dust around to hide any footprints. I just don't feel like it yet. I'm quite happy rocking back and forth on my bed for now, thinking. What happened last night? I never really believed in paranormal things or anything like that. I'm the kind of person who'd be the last to believe in such things. But what happened that night changed everything. It was around 10 p.m. I was comfortably settled on the couch watching a series on Netflix. The soft light from the screen illuminated the room, while the silence of the house was broken only by the characters' voices. My phone was beside me when it suddenly vibrated. Instinctively, I picked it up and saw a message from an unknown number, a number that definitely wasn't in my contacts. Curiosity took over. When I opened the conversation, a wave of dread washed over me. You are being watched. I tried to convince myself it was just my friends playing a prank, 
but the idea quickly faded when another message arrived. Look out the window. I thought about ignoring it. It was just some random number, and the idea of looking outside felt absurdly risky. But a strange sensation, like a voice inside urging me to act, led me to rise. The night was dark, and I could see nothing beyond the shadows of my own bushes. Another message. Now you don't see. Anxiety settled in my chest. I replied, almost pleading. What do you want from me? A quick response came. Leave me alone. The tension escalated as if the atmosphere around me were thickening. Then the next message made me freeze. Come to the back door. My heart raced. Reluctantly, I walked to the back, the feeling of being watched growing with each step. I sent a message, I'm here. The silence was deafening. With a courage I didn't know I had, I opened the door. My backyard was well lit, but darkness seemed to swallow everything around me. The air felt heavy and there was a sweet, almost nauseating smell that made me uneasy. Now you see. The message echoed in my mind. I looked into the darkness. At first, nothing, but then something caught my eye in the bushes. I put on my glasses trying to see better. What I saw made my blood run cold. A humanoid figure, distorted and shadowy, was there watching me. Its eyes were not eyes at all, but deep voids that seemed to absorb the light. I felt a shiver run down my spine, and before I could react, the figure sprinted toward me. I slammed the door shut and locked it immediately, my heart pounding wildly. The thing banged on the door with a tremendous force, a sound echoing as if it were testing the house's resistance. Silence. I called the police while making sure all the windows were secure. I peeked through the peephole but saw nothing. The darkness now felt denser, as if it were alive. The police arrived, but found nothing. Relief mixed with confusion made no sense. After they left, I couldn't sleep. What was that thing? What did it want? The messages continued to echo in my mind like a constant whisper reminding me that I wasn't alone. The next day I received another message, this one without warning. You thought you were free? The moment of peace I longed for never came. Days dragged on and the messages kept coming. Sometimes they were just unsettling words. I am close. Or, you cannot escape. But other times they were distorted images. As if someone were trying to show me the very essence of terror. I knew I couldn't go on like this. I needed to find out what was happening. I started researching stories of hauntings, abductions, and strange sightings. I discovered accounts of people who had encountered similar figures, beings that seemed to feed off fear, hiding in the shadows, always watching, and always waiting. One night as I was getting ready for bed, my phone vibrated again. It was a message. You still don't understand. The air felt heavier and the temperature dropped abruptly. A sense of despair overwhelmed me. I went to the window and looked outside. The darkness seemed to pulse as if it were alive. And then I saw it. The figure, now closer, clearer. It was no longer just a shadow. It was a grotesque creature with scaly skin and eyes that looked like two deep holes, empty and full of malice. The creature smiled and I realized that the true terror was just beginning. In the back of my mind, a voice whispered, You should never have looked.